The pigeonhole principle is one of those ideas that sounds completely obvious, but turns out to be pretty useful. Here's the idea. Let's say there are four pigeonholes, and let's also say we have five pigeons, each of which needs to be put into one of those holes. The pigeonhole principle says that after we've put each pigeon into a pigeonhole, there must be at least one pigeonhole that has multiple pigeons in it. And that's it. That's the whole idea. Or I suppose to state the principle a little more generally, if we have n pigeons put into m pigeonholes, and n is greater than m, then there must be at least one pigeonhole that contains more than one pigeon. When I first heard this principle, it just sounded obvious. And I wondered how an idea so straightforward and trivial could actually prove practical. But it turns out a lot of problems have solutions that, in whole or in part, can be answered by applying the pigeonhole principle. Of course, usually we're not literally talking about pigeons and pigeonholes, but instead talking more generally about any objects. If we distribute n items across m groups, and there are more items than there are groups, then at least one of those groups must have more than one item in it. Solving certain problems, then, just comes down to identifying what our pigeons and pigeonholes actually are. So today, let's take a look at some interesting applications of the pigeonhole principle. And let's start with a puzzle. Say we have a chessboard, an 8x8 grid of alternating light and dark squares. If we take dominoes, each of which can cover up two of these squares, we can lay them out in such a way that they perfectly tile this chessboard. That's not too much of a surprise. There are 64 squares on the chessboard, and here we're using 32 dominoes to cover the whole board perfectly, with no dominoes sticking out, no square left uncovered, and no square covered twice. If we remove one square from this chessboard, it's pretty clear that it's now impossible to tile the board. There's an odd number of squares, but using dominoes, we could only ever cover an even number of squares. But what if we removed two squares from the chessboard, from opposite corners of the board? Is it still possible to tile this board perfectly? It might not be so clear at first, and you can try it, attempting to lay out tiles in just the right places, but ultimately you'll find that you won't be able to. Perfectly tiling this board with dominoes isn't possible. But how do we know? Well, to tile 62 squares, we would need 31 dominoes. And importantly, when each domino is laid on the board, it's going to cover up two squares, one dark square and one light square, no matter how that domino is oriented. And how many light squares are on this chessboard anyways? Well, a full chessboard has 32 light squares, but since we removed two light squares from opposite corners of this board, we now have 30 light squares. See where this is going? We can now apply the pigeonhole principle. Our pigeons are the 31 dominoes, and our pigeonholes are the 30 light squares. Each domino needs to cover one of the light squares, and since we have more dominoes than light squares, there therefore must ultimately be at least one light square covered by multiple dominoes. And since in a perfect tiling, each square should be covered by exactly one domino, we can therefore say that a perfect tiling isn't possible. Let's take a look at another example. Let's imagine planet Earth, which for simplicity, we'll here assume is a perfect sphere. Earth can be divided into a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere, but that's not the only way to divide the Earth into two pieces. A hemisphere is just any half of the sphere and a closed hemisphere is a hemisphere that includes the dividing line between the two halves. So now, here's the question. If you pick any five points on Earth, can you find some closed hemisphere that includes at least four of those five points? We can try an example. We pick five points at random and try some different hemispheres. 
And in this case, we can eventually find a hemisphere that contains four of those five points. But will that always be the case? It turns out the answer is yes. We can start by saying that with any two points on Earth, we can use those two points as the dividing line between hemispheres. After that, we're left with three remaining points, each of which must belong to one of these two hemispheres. Do you see where the opportunity for the pigeonhole principle is? If we let the points be our pigeons, and the hemispheres be our pigeonholes, look what happens. We have more points than hemispheres, so there must be some hemisphere that has at least two points. And if that hemisphere has at least two of these points, plus the two points on the dividing line, then it therefore contains four out of the five points on Earth. So for any five places on Earth, four of them will always be on the same half of the planet, proven by the pigeonhole principle. And the pigeonhole principle isn't just useful for solving puzzles. It has practical computational consequences too. One natural extension of the principle has to do with compression, converting some longer representation of data to some shorter representation. There's a particular form of compression called lossless compression, where, as the name suggests, no information is lost in the compression process. In other words, once we have the compressed version of the data, we can perfectly reconstruct the original information. Using the pigeonhole principle, we can prove that there is no way to have a lossless compression algorithm that always produces a smaller output for any given input. How can we do that? Well, if the input has n bits, there are 2 to the n possible values the input can take on. And if the compressed output has some smaller number, say m bits, then there are 2 to the m possible outputs from this compression algorithm. There are more possible inputs than outputs, and that's the key for the pigeonhole principle. The inputs are our pigeons, the outputs are our pigeonholes, and since there are more inputs than outputs, then there must be some output that is associated with at least two different inputs. And if the same output is associated with two different inputs, then there's no way to perfectly reconstruct what the input is from this output, because we wouldn't know which of these two was actually the original data. All of these problems and more, different problems that at first glance don't look similar at all, ultimately rely on the same principle to solve them. And that's the beauty of taking some idea and formalizing it in a generalizable way. Once you know the principle, even if it's obvious, you can begin to see pigeons and pigeonholes as they appear in other, seemingly unrelated problems. And as a result, see where the principle might be helpful in solving all sorts of different problems.